Hey y'all, new day, new verse. As we continue on into Jonah, today we're picking up with chapter four as we wrap up the last little bit of Jonah here. And I think we're going into Corinthians, but I'm still just letting God lead me as always because I'm thinking it's Corinthians, but it doesn't mean it's going to be the Corinthians. But we'll find out from here as we see all each other Tuesday, God willing, because it'll be a blast, I know, either way, because it always is. Right. Let's go on into Jonah chapter 4 as we wrap it up. Lord, give me the words and help me convey it and show it the way you should it, Lord God, because it was mind-blowing. Help me do it the way you'd have me do it and put it before the people you have it for. In Jesus' name, amen. Jonah chapter 4. <laughs> yeah, I love the header on this one because it feels just so apropos. Jonah's anger at the Lord's mercy. Because it just, it feels so fitting on that one. But let's get into it. So, or this change of plans greatly upset Jonah. He became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? Th this is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Yahweh. I'd rather be dead than alive if, I, if what I predicted will not happen. And the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry about this? Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And Yahweh God, the Lord, arranged for a leafy plant to grow there. And so it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You feel sorry about the plant that you did nothing to put there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness who don't know their right hand from their left, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry if they're such a great city? No. Jonah, Jonah's an interesting one. You know, we've been talking about this, and as you guys probably saw, the, or saw the most likely the title of the last one, it is those moments when we get angry enough at God to die. We throw the temper tantrum. We act like the child, and we get indignant because of how God chose to pour out his mercy. You know, and as I was studying this section, I, there were three parables that came to mind. You know, the parable of the farm owner who hires on the farm hands at the different times in Matthew 20, verse 1, 6 through 16, who, you know, very beginning of the day, okay, I'll pay you a day's wage, so they go to work. A little later in the day, three hours later, next group, same thing, pay him a day's wage, same thing, all the way until five o'clock at night. You know, and then begins by paying them first. Gives them the same thing that the first farmhands who had been working the entire day were paid. And they get annoyed. You know, what the crap, we've been doing this this entire time, and they're the ones who get it. Well, why not, you know? And they're told, well, you agreed to do it this way, so why are you getting upset? I, I said I would do it my way, so I'm doing it my way. And how resentful those first farmers were being. It's like, well, we've done all of this thing, and you're welcoming. These people haven't done anything at all. Well, why did he welcome them? Because, I mean, he asked them. No one's hired them. They've been sitting there all day wishing someone would hire them, wishing they could actually put their hand to something. You know, that it's a hand up, not a hand out. And the farm owner helps. You know, a parable that also came to mind is the Luke fifteen eleven, the parable of the lost son. You know, the father divvies up the resources. One so, uh, you know, prodigal son. We all know this one. Or, or if we've been around church long enough, we do. You know, <laughs> prodigal son. One goes, blows all the money. Prostitutes, whoring, gambling, etc. Hey, city of sin, what do you know? 
other son ends up just staying but becomes begrudging when the father, who is just glad to have his son back, is throwing a party. It's like, you never gave me a goat. Did you ask? Like, the father straight up says everything he has is the son's. So why didn't the son ask for a goat? Why didn't the son ask for something like that? And, you know, I'm not trying to equate this into real worlds or any of that prosperity crap. What I mean is, the son, the, the son that stayed was begrudging the mercy and the joy that his father was experiencing at having his son back. You know, we had to do this. Your brother was dead, and now he is alive. He was lost, but now he's found. You know, that same kind of jump for joy moment that Jacob had when he ha found out that Joseph was still alive. Said, wait, 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 wait. My, cause let's, let's put it that way. Let's put the particle son in that direction. You know, Joseph, who's been gone all of this time, and Jacob gives him back alive. That mind-blowing, what? how can this be, experience. That's just glad that such a great and wonderful and kind thing would happen. Because it's a miracle. It's so more so for the parent of a hurting and lost child. You, know, you don't want to see anyone suffer when God is putting his compassion in your heart. You least of all want to see it when it's a friend. You least more so want to see it as, as being your own child. It hurts to see and you want to help it. And when you can't do anything about it, you just sit back and watch. It sucks. And just the sheer joy of this father that not only did his son come back alive, but his son now actually understands something deeper. You know, he's coming back with a lesson that he didn't have before he left. A lesson he needed to learn. And the last parable that I was thinking of when I was reading through this chapter, when we started all of this, was, the Lazar was uh, Lazarus and the rich man. Rich man and Lazarus both die. Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. He's in paradise. He's happy. He's in bliss. And the rich man, he's suffering. And, you know, Abraham, send, you know. He doesn't treat Lazarus as a person. Laz uh, the rich man doesn't treat Lazarus as a human being. The rich man treats him as less than nothing. Doesn't even use his name all the way through. Not until the very end, and even then I don't recall him using it once. Even in the death place of suffering and hellish morbidity that the man had chosen because of his way of life, he still didn't care to see Lazarus as a person. You know, the entire point of the love letter is that God sees us, that came in the flesh to die for us so that we could be reunited with him. All humanity. The promise was to all of humanity through Abraham. Like, this, like, that's the, it's the entire storyline. Like, God chooses this one family to single out, to bless, straight through the family line so that all people can come back. How Paul put it well, through one man's sin, all been cursed, one through, and, you know, because Jesus died for us, we can walk out new humanity. But I was thinking about how all three of these parables and Jonah have in common that Jonah acts exactly like them. Because all four of them, the rich man toward Lazarus, Jonah up toward God about the tree, the disgruntled son toward his father about the prodigal son, and the farmhands who were paid just as much even though they'd worked the entire day. They're disgruntled because God is loving those who they claim are their enemies. The brother and the prodigal son, he's still pissed off at his brother. He says as such. The farmhands, just about the fact that they've been working an entire day. They say as such. You know, the, last, uh, the rich man. No, it's better than suffering. He shows by his words that he does not care that Lazarus is a human being, one of God's own creation, and much the same way Jonah, irritated that God would care about Nineveh, a city that God himself calls great, 
And why wouldn't he? He's the one who made it great. For his own purposes. To do it in the infinite cosmic ballet of time and space that transcends human underbeing, understanding, concept, or thought. The kind of thing that Jonah was, or not Jonah, Job, sorry, the kind of thing that Job had pointed out to him quite well in that last chapter. It comes down to trust in that point. Do we trust that God truly is sovereign? Because if he's sovereign, and his word is true that a life completely surrendered to him is completely his responsibility, as he says, then wouldn't it stand to reason that all we have to do is walk out in what we're told? He dresses the lilies in beauty and splendor. How much more will he take care of us? You know, I was reminded of this actually just earlier today because of a tomato that had grown inside our house. You know, no real bees or pollinators to get in there, but it's still been pollinated. And it was the most beautiful color of red. A red that man can't replicate. We try. But with the subtle nuances of color and shape and tone and the fact that the skin of a tomato is partially translucent, humanity couldn't pull that off. And if God cares so much to work that beauty of color into a tomato that about that big that can be just popped in an instant because it's literally just like seriously that big then how much more so will he take care of us how much more so does he want to because remember Jonah what he said his prophecy did come true it would be overturned in those days it was completely overturned spiritually because the entire city repented. And here we have Jonah now, angry about, oh, well, I'm angry enough to die because the tree went away. And I just don't want to live in a world where you're going to care about these people. Because all of them have in common the same thing we do as a body when we start to act like religion instead of focusing on the relationship we need to have with God for him to soften our hearts, lest we become like Pharaoh. It's love. It's accepting that God wants everyone. That the behaviors that we don't agree with that need to be corrected, that's his job. (laughs) In relationship with him, he will do that. He will take care of it. He is God. Now we've talked before in Matthew, Jesus says how you talk with a believer who's out of place. It's always about love. Even at the very end, treat him like a tax collector. Love. Because remember, Matthew... Levi was a tax collector. And Jesus called him to be a disciple. Right alongside Simon the Zealot. Now how's that for an interesting way of showing how the kingdom really looks? A conspirator with a rebel. These two had no reason to like each other. No reason to get along. They were so adverse in thinking and dichotomy, it is a miracle that they didn't kill each other. Because again, one of them was a tax collector. Seen as completely outcasted, poor of spirit. Because wasn't seen as a person. He was working alongside those who were enslaving them. To many, he may as well have been holding the whip. To Simon, probably was when they first got together. And yet, and yet, Jesus chose them both. Levi, Matthew, the conspirator, and Simon, the zealot. A person who was quite happily going to overthrow the government the manual way. You know, with the sharp end. So that he would have been no different from the Barabbas that was released in Jesus' place. A revolutionary murderer. But God chose him for something different. And chose him alongside Levi. And chose him alongside the other ten. So that all twelve would point out very clearly that it is not about religion. 
It is about surrender and relationship. It is about people who had to have nothing to do with each other outside God's kingdom coming together in love. Coming together to take care of others. Because the beginning, oh yeah, they were Levi and Simon and the Zealot. But by the end, they were the twelve apostles. Part of them. I mean, Matthew's book is a thing for a reason. Help change so much. Because they decided to put down their earthly way of viewing each other and pick up gods. It doesn't see Levi as a tax collector, but Matthew as a man of God. Simon is not a zealot, but a man of zeal, chasing after the Lord. And so they become hand in hand, the hands and feet. How different would the body look? How different would our lives look if we walked that out? If we truly said, no, 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 I'm not going to judge by your past, by your current, or any of that crap that is not my business. Because, yeah, I see your speck, but man, I got a lumber mill growing here. Because <laughs> that's the real of it, isn't it? I mean, we get to the point where we're high and mighty, and we say, oh, no, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have. I mean, Jesus himself said to the Pharisees, when you say you wouldn't have been the person to cast a stone, you're probably one of the people who would have killed the prophets. Because we don't know. And if we're presumptuous enough to think that we're better than someone, are we really showing that we're better or are we showing that we're worse? Because we're casting them down. Yeah, they may be making a stupid moral choice, but they are not a stupid moral choice. Let's take Saul of Tarsus, Paul, if you will, from Acts. He's holding coats while Stephen is being stoned to death. In a moment, morally scum. Yeah, he <laughs> watched another human being get stoned to death and didn't, he, he applauded. It's you. That moment is you. But Paul was not that moment. Saul was not that moment. He can't be judged by just that one moment because it had not been for that. Do we know if he would have ever had the zeal to go after everyone and Jesus to go, why are you persecuting me? We don't know. But so often we'll condemn without thinking about it. So often we will tell God who he is allowed to save and who he is allowed to welcome into his kingdom. We'll tell him who he's allowed to love. And so we act like the farmhands. Well, you're not allowed to love them the same. You're not allowed to give them the same wage. I've been doing this right my entire life. I haven't sinned. I haven't sworn. So how are you being no blessing for them? Because they were dead. And now they're alive. They were lost in spiritual darkness like the people of Nineveh. And now they can see. They were dead and now they are alive. And so often we act like Jonah. Well, we will jump up and down and scream and shout and say, Why, God, why, how could you be so kind to people who betrayed me? How could you welcome into heaven somebody who did such a cruel thing? Yeah, it's really weird to think about. But it goes back to that Job place. Do we really understand? He knows the heart. For us, it's about showing that we worship the God of Jacob, the God of love. A God who came in the flesh died in our place so that we might be reunited in relationship. A God who at the very first sin spoke a promise of redemption. That the serpent would have his head crushed even though he pierced the heel of the one crushing him. The very first sin, a prophecy toward the promise of Jesus. All the way through, promise after promise, showing that it is meant for all tribes, all nations, all tongues to confess that He is God. How can anyone do that if we're not loving them enough for them to see there is a difference between the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the religious re sword that has been used to club people to death? It's about a different way of living entirely. 
a way of living where giving is natural because even the breath is borrowed. Where mercy makes the most sense because He is merciful to us. And when we get to show that same kind of mercy, trusting that He will set all right, we don't we don't win these wars with the pointy end against flesh and blood. We win it by living the life of love that He showed us how. Fear not, for He has conquered the world. He's conquered it, so chasing after Him is going to look a lot the same. And that means forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Not as a condescending religious, oh, well, I know better. But in a, no, they don't. And I know they don't because I didn't know better. Because in a reality where you hadn't chosen me, I would be there. I would be throwing the stones. In another reality where God did not choose us, where God did not shower us with more grace and abundant love and mercy than we have any right to. Any. We would be the same cold-hearted, savage behavior that is out there. And I know it because before we were saved, we all were. And if we're honest, we still are. That's the whole wrestling against flesh and blood thing that Paul talked about, where we take the thoughts captive unto the Lord each moment, and so it is easier to walk out His way. Because it's a refining process. It's a process of trust. It's a process that takes us from being angry that God could be merciful to people we hate, to rejoicing that 120,000 people are now having the opportunity to walk in spiritual light. So the question is this as we wrap up Jonah, who do we want to be? Do we want to be the rich man looking down at Lazarus from hell? <laughs> or looking down on Lazarus while he's in hell? Do, do we want to be the farmers who are mad that God would take somebody who is just begging for life and reviving them? Like the farm has. Do we want to be the brother who is upset that this family member has come back? Because think about the difference in these two brothers and how Esau responded to Jacob. Esau, Edom, was gracious. He was kind. He gave a gift that was undeserved, and that is the very definition of grace. And if we're not walking in the understanding that it is grace upon grace from Him so that we love others and are our brother's keeper, the intimate friendship so that we know and can call out these things. Again, back to relationship, back to community, back to connection. Our Creator God, very nature, is other-centric love. Three persons, one, uh, three in one. God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son. And we'll go into that more later because there are people that would know the eschatology of, I think that's the word, of it way better than I do. Just getting to the fact that if His very nature is other-centric love, why wouldn't us, why wouldn't our, be, our nature be? Why shouldn't we be? If we don't understand that it's about grace that's undeserved, unearned, and given freely, we haven't learned a thing yet. And that's okay. Because like Paul says in Romans, we have time to turn around. God gives us the opportunity to turn to Him so that we can love, so that we do love. So that it's not a begrudging arm, trend, or arm wrench. It's done because we are fundamentally different. Because He is making us fundamentally different. That's the beauty of grace. And that's the difference between being Jonah and being a follower of God. Between being angry that God is 
slow to anger, merciful and compassionate, filled with unfailing love. Or we can be angry that the same characteristics that saved us are being shared with others. If we're angry about it, then we don't understand it. And if we understand it, we're glad more are welcome. Because it's a big, big house. Lots and lots of room. And all are welcomed. Jesus said himself that the owner of the house will send out anyone who's not dressed for the wedding. We get to invite. He does the rest. And we do that by living love instead of being angry like Jonah. I'll see you guys, God willing, for Tuesday. Depend on pain meds, I pick them up Wednesday. Have faith and know that he loves you. And that when you're struggling and you're trying, that's okay. He's got plenty of love and patience for that too and wants to make us into the new creation that he promised. Just surrendering it to him. And we do that by starting to be okay with the fact that God wants everyone. We do that by laying down our definitions. Our definitions of everything. Because we can go right back to Genesis 1 with that. Eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Humanity spends all of its time saying what is good and what isn't. What if we let him decide? Just love. That's what it looks like the call is to me. I hope to talk about it with you in the comments. Don't give up hope. And don't be afraid when you stumble. Because he loves. And there's always more room for him to grow inside, to take over, to cast everything that isn't him out, and to give a true place of peace. It's just about letting him take the lead. I will see you guys then. May his favor be upon you. Know that you are loved. And remember, when we ask him to teach us how to do it, he will. It just may hurt when we're a little stubborn along the way. I can vouch for that one. I'll see you, God willing, then.